Good evening. Welcome to the Great Lakes Horror Company podcast. Now, this podcast has been put together by members of the Horror Writers Association Ontario chapter, and we thought we would start with an explanation of what the HWA is and a little bit about what the organization does before we meet today's panel. The Horror Writers Association was founded in 1987, and originally it was called Howell, but shortly thereafter the name was changed to the Horror Writers of America. And then once everyone start, started realizing that this was an international kind of thing, they changed it to the Horror Writers Association. Now, in the 90s, Ado Van Belkin was running the Ontario chapter of the Horror Writers Association, and I took it over from him then and have been running it ever since. One of my mandates for running the Ontario chapter is to provide an outlet and opportunity for Canadian horror writers, artists, editors, filmmakers, and so on, to have an opportunity to network with each other and learn about each other and provide opportunities for each other under the umbrella of the HWA. Also, we are able to do things like have booths at conventions. We've appeared at many places such as Word on the Street, Comic-Con, Fan Expo, Horrorama, which is a brand new horror convention um, that has been put together by Chris Alexander, who used to be the editor for Fangoria magazine, and Louis Chris, who um, is the owner of Suspect Video. There are also many other wonderful conventions that we appear at, Niagara Falls Comic Con and Ad Astra, and we did inspire as well, although they are no longer with us. We have monthly meetings, and here's where we network with each other and make our plans for world domination. And uh, our president of the HWA at large uh, is Lisa Morton, and the vice president right now is John Palisano, and both of them currently live in Los Angeles. So the, a lot of the major HWA people live in Los Angeles right now just because of the way the elections fell and the way things are. And it's very exciting, um, all the opportunities that this organization does provide for a lot of us. At any rate, we hope you will enjoy coming along for the ride every week as we explore all sorts of topics that are wonderfully horrific and interview some very interesting writers, artists, editors, filmmakers, and other creative horror types. That is right. Um, I'm Andrew Robertson. I'm a member of the HWA Ontario chapter, and I'm a relative newbie. Um, I joined because I was looking for a sense of community to, uh, to help me get down to writing that book that's been in my head for a million years. And uh, it's been an incredibly positive experience. So I'm going to be moderating, moderating a bit of a discussion here uh, with the authors around the table just so that you can get to know the panel that will be with us for the next month for all of our February shows. So I'm going to start by asking Sephra, who did our introduction, to tell you all a little bit about uh, what she's done, what she's published, what horrible things have come out of her mind. <laughs> so Sephra, let us know a little bit about your publishing history. All right. Um, well, some people may know that uh, the thing I'm most proud of is that I was an author for Leisure Books uh, way back in the day. Uh, well, not that far back, I guess. I did four books with Leisure. And I've done a couple books recently with Sam Hain or Sawin Publications, Horror Publishing. And then coming up now, I have a, a new thing I'm doing called, I'm doing a series about witches. It's erotic astrology horror series. I, it's kind of like horror likes. It's not like the really extreme horror that I'm known for. It's, it's a little lighter. And uh, this will be called the Witch Upon a Star series. And uh, the first few books will be coming out any minute. And I'm really excited about it. It. Where can people find you online? Um, they can find me uh, by Googling my name, uh, which is a difficult name, I know. And I have several blogs, uh, sephwriters666.blogspot.ca, tarotpaths.blogspot.ca. You can find me on Instagram under my real name and on Twitter under my real name. Fantastic. So our next panelist for the coming month is Suzanne Church. Suzanne, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, uh, I'm a horror writer, but I also write science fiction and fantasy. I live in uh, Kitchener, Ontario, which isn't very far from the epicenter of all that is horror, which is the Toronto area. I uh, 
at the very end of January, my first novel came out. It's called Soul Larcenist, and it's part of the Helma series from the new Ed Greenwood group. And that book is the first in a trilogy, and the other two books will be coming out in uh, 2017. I'm very excited to be part of the HWA. I've always enjoyed the networking opportunities that exist for us, and I'm really looking forward to talking on the podcast tonight. Where can uh, the people listening find you online? Uh, SuzanneChurch.com is the portal that takes you everywhere. I'm on Twitter uh, as Canadian Suzanne. I have blogs and all the links are on my, my main page. Okay, great. And next we have Bill Snyder, also known as Zombie Zach. That Welcome. Would, that was the goal and that would be me. I'm just a guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. No. Um, most of the time I'm doing uh, horror poetry. I've got a number of horror short stories out. Uh, there will be more coming from me over the next few years. I have thousands of ideas going through my head at any given time. Uh, but the poetry has been one of the things that I've been doing most of. And philosophy stuff is probably going to be some of the stuff that's coming out this year. Beyond that? Now, where can people find you? And you should also probably plug your podcast on this podcast. Well... <laughs> Okay. I also have my own uh, live radio show, which is on Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. It's called After Rot. Uh, the premise is anything zombies, comic books, or anything else to feel like talking about. Uh, where you can find me is on Facebook under zombiezack.zz, or if you're not American, ZZ. Um, or on general web, it's zombiezack.com. Awesome. And our final pal- panelist... Palinist. Palinist. <laughs> even a Man. panelist, even. I'm leaving that. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> Is Monica Kubler. Hello, everyone. Um, you may have heard my name. I'm the managing editor of Rumor Magazine. When I'm not doing that, I'm writing a fairly popular online serial for teens called The Blood Magic Saga which is full of magic and vampires, the kind of vampires with fangs, not the kind of vampires that are romancing you. Um, And yeah, I got involved with the HWA uh, several years ago when I started to get really interested in writing horror fiction because I just wanted to network, I wanted to learn, and I thought that the HWA would offer uh, an excellent opportunity for both of those and also to get out into the community and just support horror because... You're really only as good as your community is, and the horror community has is welcoming and strong and really kind to each other. And that's something that you know you maybe don't find as much in science fiction or fantasy or some of the other genre. But one thing I've discovered working in horror for 15 years is horror writers and editors we're all really all about helping each other out and that's what made the Horror Writers Association really exciting as an organization that I wanted to join so I think that's actually a good point uh, for some discussion before we get to our interview segment today is what are some of the benefits that you found from being part of an organization that was built by built for and supports writers Well, I'd like to mention uh, how much things have changed since I first became a member, because I I was a member pretty much since, almost since the beginning, maybe about five years in, and, you know, obviously we've had technology now. Back in the day, uh, with the Horror Writers Association, it was the only touchstone you had to learn about market reports, gossip, or anything like that, and you waited for bated breath for that newsletter to come in the mail, so you so. knew where to go. <laughs> you know? It was touchstone, but no touch screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything was being done on typewriters. <laughs> That's right. And then, eventually, there, there became some technology, and HWA was one of the first kind of places that had a place on what was called Genie back in the day, which was a DOS system. But uh, all you young people don't even know what I'm talking about. Your brain would hurt if I even tried to tell you how (laughs) this all worked. But then I I got networking with people on there. I'm like, you know, typing with like some of these famous people I'd read about. And I was all uh, geekified. It was like so amazing. And, And then so it was interesting because then... Um, and, you know, now it's a whole new world with technology. But back then it'd be like, oh, you'd talk a little bit in these little weird chat rooms. And then you'd go to a convention and you'd actually meet these people. And it was so cool. 
But now it's almost gone the other way with Facebook and stuff. It seems like there's always a horror convention every minute of the day wherever you go because, you know, everyone's online and information is so much more accessible. But now we have other interesting new frontiers to discover. Um, but, yeah, like HWA saved my life, you know, when I was home, home alone with the little babies, you know, and there was nothing. But I'd read that little magazine and I was so excited to get my market reports and and then just wanting to get published with all the other people that did. So, Suzanne, in joining the HWA, did you did you find any particular benefit or something that that clicked that you thought was a, was something that added to your experience as a writer? I was quite surprised once I joined HWA at how many horror writers there were out there that I had either not read or I had never met or I'd never heard of. And once I got into the community, I realized, as Monica was mentioning earlier, just how friendly and kind and welcoming and open and sharing the horror community was. And the more time I spent with different horror writers, horror poets, horror screenplay writers, the more I realized that that was a community I really wanted to belong to. I wanted to to jump in the pond and be a part of that. And to me, that's what being in HWA is all about, is that opportunity to reconnect. As Seffel was mentioning, of course we see each other online, you know, we follow each other on Twitter, we go to each other's Facebook pages, that sort of thing. But there's nothing quite like face-to-face -face contact. And if you can't necessarily go to all the conventions that happen, at least we can uh, have our table at a convention that's close by, and that gives us a chance to meet other people who want to get involved with HWA and just open our doors and be more sharing and more open for new people. Because you know, I've manned the booth several times, and it's amazing how many people we meet that have never heard of HWA. They're interested in horror, but they had no idea it existed. And to me, that giving back is just as important as being part of something. I, I do Absolutely. think that as writers, you're constantly looking for a sense of community because you work in such absolute isolation. Um, and, and there is definitely a benefit to having other people around that can either talk about their experience, their writing process, or even just read something and give you a couple of words about it. Uh, so, Bill, you're quite an active member of HWA Ontario chapter. Uh, you're at a lot of the meetings. What... What sort of benefit, what value have, have you drawn out of being a member? Well, the biggest benefit, obviously, is always the networking, interconnecting with other people and being able to absorb information, both in the raw sense of just best practices, uh, things that work, things that don't work, areas to go, areas to play, all of the different tools that are available as a writer to want to get access to. Uh, as an example, discussions earlier today here were with people talking about specific software to integrate with, how to deal with Skype and doing other stuff like that. So that kind of exchange of raw information, both on the micro level and the macro level, is awesome because it, it gives you a sense of not just connecting to other people, but to an organization that's larger with resources to actually to be able to get into stuff like the different conventions and the other uh, events that are going to be going through and stuff. Okay, so now our listeners have a sense of who we are and, uh, and who's going to be joining them over the next four podcast episodes. Uh, coming up, we have Suzanne Church, who you've just met, uh, in an interview with Otto, Ottawa-based author and storyteller Marie Bilodeau. Uh, so we're going to flip to that right now, and we'll be right back. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the HWA Ontario podcast. I'm Suzanne Church, and tonight I will be speaking with Marie Bilodeau. All right, so for those of you who may not be familiar with Marie Bilodeau, she is an Ottawa-based science fiction and fantasy author with a whole pile of novels and short stories to her name, and as I do believe that some of those have even won some super shiny, awesome awards. She's a native Montrealer and a professional performing storyteller, which is interesting. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And armed with a bachelor's degree in religion and culture with a minority in archaeology from Wilfrid Laurier University, which is in my stomping ground, Marie mostly tells adaptations of fairy tales and myths, as well as original stories of her own creation. She's performed in multiple venues across Canada, including Ottawa's National Arts Centre. To get her geek on, she co-hosts the weekly Planet X podcast, along with Jay Ojik and Ken Bonney. Now, what's very interesting about Marie 
is that right now she's writing a six book bodiless series for the Ed Greenwood Group's Helma setting. That's TEG, the Ed Greenwood Group, to those of you who aren't familiar with the new venture that Ed Greenwood has put together. Her first book in the series is called Eye of Glass, and it will be the fifth Helma book released on, I believe it's February 29th, and it will be the one right after my novel, Soul Larcenist, is released on January 31st. So here's a sense of the copy on the back of the book for those of you who can't wait to get your hands on Eye of Glass. Following a slight misfire with a prank on a cop involving herself as the dead body, Jada finds herself confined to a small room with only a TV as company. Relaxing will help her regenerate her mostly missing body, but that's entirely too boring for her liking. Besides, she has better things to do with her time, like becoming a model. But when her guardian and keeper vanishes, Jada has to move quickly to avoid capture and save herself, her guardian, and her new human pets. Regenerating will simply have to wait. There are six books planned, and the, I believe, tentative titles are Eye of Glass, Lips of Blood, Shoe of Bone, Hand of Knives, Flesh of Decay, and Spine of Steel, the last book being published, believe it or not, in February of 2022. So I want to ask you, Marie, wow, what an undertaking. Do you have this whole series completely plotted out? Mostly. <laughs> I have a synopsis for each of the books, so I have an idea of what needs to happen. And there's kind of this overarching uh, arc uh, for the story across all six books. So what needs to be presented in the first book that won't be resolved until the sixth book. And then kind of the main thrusting points along the way, what will be resolved in each book and new questions will be presented and kind of an idea of what happens with the secondary plots as well and the secondary characters, because they're really important to the overall story. Uh, but it's not, you know, religiously plotted, if you will. Uh, it's plotted enough that I can pull it off with style and grace and a lot of fun. Right. So at least it, you know where you're going, even if you take a few detours along the way. Exactly, exactly especially when committing. I've never committed such a long series before, so I wanted to make sure I could pull off such a, a good story and keep it a long story and keep it tense the whole way through. Well, you know, I know exactly how you feel because I am in the midst of writing book two in a trilogy. And uh, it's always interesting after you write the first book, there are always changes you have to make to your outline because the characters in the first book took me at least in some unexpected directions. Did that happen to you? Definitely. And that's kind of the part of the fun of writing a series, I find. Uh, it definitely did that. And especially on the secondary character end. I mean, the main arc of the story stayed the same. So the one that really affected the protagonist, Jada. But uh, the secondary characters took it in all types of fun directions that I simply didn't expect. So that left a lot of room for growth, which is great. Did you actually come up with some characters as, as the book went along, walk-ons that you, you never expected would have joined the book that are now almost taking control of the story? <laughs> Definitely. You know, I have this this vast empire uh, inside the book. It's a web on-site forum. So it's called the Widow Web Forum. And it's uh, it's basically these people who are trying to find demons across the world. So they're all online and they're just tag names. They're like Born Pretty, uh, Surly One, uh, Honey Boy. Like they're just their little tag names. Like some people are on the forums, right? You just know them by their code name, their avatars. And the fun part about that is a lot of them had a lot more depth than I thought they would to thrust the story forward. And uh, because of that, I actually have a novella in the series coming out. It's a companion novella, so it still has to do with the main, the world of it, the, the city, the same characters. But it takes some of those people from that forum and suddenly gives them a whole story outside of Jada's realm of storydom, if you will, which is really cool. That sounds interesting. So is each one of your novels going to have a pre-story and a post-story as well? Definitely, yeah. I've got the pre-story and the post-story for both of them, and I've tried to set them so that they do kind of set up the book, but if you read the novel without reading the pre-story, you're okay. And same if you read the pre-story without going to the novel. Why you wouldn't is beyond me, though. But still, you could. <laughs> and the same for the post. Yeah, you know, I've, I've run into the same thing. I've tried to create short stories that would be interesting for the fans, but if you only pick up the book, you won't miss out on, on the arc in the book. 
by not reading the two stories. Yeah, it's just kind of uh, yummy extra goodness. Exactly. It's tasty. Sunday toppings, you know, like the whipped cream and the sprinkles. You don't need them on the Sunday, but the Sunday is better with them for sure. Exactly. Well said. (laughs) All right. So... You also devote some of your time to live storytelling, as I mentioned during your bio. Uh, You've described it as the oldest existing performance art. How exactly did you get started with storytelling? (laughs) I got started about 11 years ago in storytelling. Um, And and the reason I got started, it was 2005, and I was really trying to get published at this point. I had written a couple of novels. I had written a bunch of short stories, and I was mostly hitting that rejection phase of my writing career. And I heard of storytelling, which is really what it sounds for people who haven't seen it. It's it's really like the idea of a bar, the idea of sitting around the fire and telling a story, except I do it in a professional capacity. And I heard of storytelling. I took the course and my logic was that if I tell stories, people are going to be my captive audience. Suddenly it was like I was self-publishing live on the stage with, with even more spectacular occasions for failure in front of people. It was completely awesome, uh, which is much worse, by the way, than receiving a rejection letter in the mail is when you see their eyes glossing over as you're trying to keep them captive. I've gotten better since then. I can imagine. It's probably a combination of thrill and absolute dread. <laughs> Because like any comedian or live performer, you know, there's always that horrible moment of what if what if all of a sudden they look like they don't like it anymore? And what do you do? <laughs> the oh, that... no. Should I stop? Should I make up something completely different? You pretend faint. It's the only way to go. <laughs> What I've what I've learned is that you have to be good at improvising and reading your audience. But generally, if you bring the right energy to the stage and you get excited by your own story, even if it's a really dark story, um, you can still get them on board to feel those emotions that you want them to feel. But definitely more improvising than I ever thought would exist in such an art form. Considering the fact that most people enjoy a little dirt, have you ever been in the middle of one of these performances and all of a sudden just hit a wall and thought, oh, my gosh. I have absolutely no idea what happens next. I did. And you know what? So I'm at a tea party. It's a cute tea shop in the Ottawa's downtown uh, in the market, the Byward Market, which is really nice, has these little provincial shops. And I'm in a tea shop. I'm telling this story that I made up about a uh, basically a mermaid. And it's very lovely. It's, it's a love story. It's sad. It's got these forlorn moments. And I hit this moment where I just blocked and I look down at the audience and everyone, nobody knows I'm blocked, but I know I'm blocked. And I just usually it's kind of in slow motion. You're telling the story and your brain is like three scenes ahead preparing for you to tell that. And, and there was a big blank spot coming up and, and my mom was in the audience and I'm like, no, I'm not going to fail. This is going to be awesome. So I said, you know what? Let's just hand it over to the universe. I read memes on Facebook. They say that trust in the universe and stuff like that. Awesome. I'll try this. So I did. Next thing I know, I suddenly have an orgy going on in my story in the tea party um, in with my mother in the room. So it, it doesn't necessarily work to improvise sometimes on stories. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Hmm. Yes, I think an orgy would go well here, but that's my mom right over there. <laughs> and, and is that going to go? <laughs> And, and it's one of those things that starts to happen when you're there. Well, she's naked and then everyone else is getting naked to get comfortable because they don't want to make her seem ostracized. And, and the more I went with it and tried to justify what I had done, I couldn't pull it back. So I just dove in and let's just own this. Let's have an orgy. That's right. I just don't look in your mom's direction. <laughs> Pretend she's not there, right? Yeah, she, she's a like French Canadian hippie from the 1970s. So she, she, oh, can she would, it. yeah. She, she'd she'd handle it no problem. Like, yeah, and, and English isn't her first language, too. So and she's not that great at it, thank goodness. So maybe she missed some of it. <laughs> maybe orgy means something different than what I think it means. <laughs> Which is how she in French, so I don't know what I'm missing here. <laughs> Probably not. Yes. Well, speaking of French and being bilingual, have you ever been working in a story and all of a sudden you hit this moment or this phrase where you wish you could switch to French because it would be easier or would create better? better turns of phrase than you could possibly pull off in English? You know, it happens. uh, It does happen sometimes, not as often as it used to. My assimilation is going great. Um, It used to happen a lot more. But what I find is whenever I have these turns of phrase and and I'm drafting and I try not to stop and edit myself when I'm drafting, I edit a lot afterwards. 
So I'm drafting and I decide, you know what, I'll just follow my instincts and kind of use some of that French turn of phrase. And sometimes it works beautifully, but most of the times those are the sentences I have to change, unfortunately, when either I reread or, you know, my editor tells me that doesn't make any sense. No, I thought it did. Yeah, trust me, it's way better in French. <laughs> yes, I mean, French, it sounds awesome. <laughs> Do you feel as though women writing horror bring a different perspective to the fiction table? I do, definitely. I mean, I I think that the more of any group of anything that writes in any genre would bring uh, a depth and uh, something different to it. Uh, One of the like, and I mean, that means any sexual orientation, different minorities, you know, all of that, that those fun, different life experiences that we have through uh, with women in horror. I find that a lot of times the characters I find from the ones I've read do have a lot more depth sometimes and uh, just a richness of language and of character Um, not to say that the male writers don't either because they certainly do that we have we're lucky to have so many great authors who write a horror at the moment and before too but yeah I think there's definitely a new voice and that shift you know there there are those gentle stories and those really harsh slasher stories and there's room for everyone in horror and which is wonderful that it's uh it's opening up and becoming more and more diverse a genre I agree it gives more uh for horror readers to find too because then they're not always just getting one color one piece of the palette they're getting the whole spectrum exactly i know that you do podcasts and you're doing this podcast for us tonight if you could interview one of the characters from one of your many stories or books on one of your podcasts which one would it be and why (laughs) right now as i'm writing another novella in my helma series it would be black queen who's the leader of the widow web forum and i would ask her what exactly are you doing because i see you're doing something and i see it's powerful but i'm not exactly sure what it is that you're doing um but but that's more an applauding sound but seriously i would love to actually um to interview jada my main character from this because she's insane she makes no sense she's crazy her points of view are are very out there they they're not grounded in anything she doesn't even have feet to ground herself with she's just a head on with a spine uh and i think she would make a wicked a very confusing interview well that's fascinating yeah you know it's interesting that people who are a little bit on the I don't want to say crazy side, but let's say mentally challenged side. They often can take conversations in different directions than the average bear would take them in. And that always makes for fascinating listening. Exactly. Yeah. And and I would love to see what she would say, because in the book, she is she is not she's the nuttiest character I've ever written. And I absolutely adore her. Oh, well, that's awesome. That <laughs> must make it much, way more fun to write about her. It really does. I laughed a lot. I still laugh when I read it. Have you ever had that situation, that moment when you're sitting in a coffee shop or a public place and you're in the middle of writing something and all of a sudden something really funny happens and you start laughing and then you think, <laughs> hmm, does everyone in this room think I'm laughing at nothing? No, really, I'm laughing at something. Really, I am. I, I did. And, and the problem is I think I'm hilarious and I start laughing sometimes and then that just goes me into writing more funny stuff and then I laugh so hard. And But the cute thing is uh, just when I was writing Helma, I was at Second Cup at one point uh, in Ottawa, and a woman actually came to me and she she said, it's nice to see someone, you know, laughing and smiling in a coffee shop. And I hadn't even realized I was laughing at the time. So <laughs> that made me question my sanity. But, you know, it was nice to see at least somebody appreciated it. Only one person, but still. You know, you got to start somewhere. And one is the first number. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, the next series of questions I'm going to ask are like flash questions. So what I need you to do is try to answer with the first idea that pops into your head. Okay. I'm ready. So are, you, are you ready? I'm totally ready. I'm okay. championing it up. Okay. Let's start with a totally Canadian question. Imagine a prison of eternal misery. Is it hot or cold? Oh, do I have to pit either one? I'd say it's comfy. Comfy. A prison of eternal misery is comfy. <laughs> well, I'm probably going to be there. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, would you rather be the queen of the realm or a decorated warrior? Decorated warrior. They can still get drunk. They don't have responsibility. Nobody questions them. That's true. And probably no one's trying to poison them in their sleep either. Exactly. It's wicked. Do you like your horror with plenty of dismemberment and gore? Or are you more of a squeaky floor in the night, quiet horror person? It depends how busy I am. I like the dismemberment when I'm really busy. Otherwise, I love the squeaky floors. Right. Call it a mood thing. Yeah. What are you in the mood for? 
If you were only allowed to read one book more than once in your lifetime, what book would you choose? Oh, that's horrible. Why would anybody have to go through that? I know it's terrible. It's like, you know, the knife at gunpoint. You have to pick one. Just one? Well, yeah. Just oh, one. just one. Okay. Uh, you know, I'd have to go for, uh, and that's just because I did a King Arthur so, but Tennyson's Idols of the King because they make me happy. Ah, uh-huh. very good choice. Now, this is going to be an interesting one because I know you spoke about working in a tea shop. Would you pick tea or coffee? Ooh, ooh, I'd pick tea and coffee with hot chocolate inside. Oh, that's ooh. gross. I love it. <laughs> you know, I actually become quite fond of hot chocolate and coffee together. It's, oh, it's a fantastic combo. It is. Bless the hearts whoever came up with that. I know, right? All right. Stickers on your laptop or do you like your laptop pure out of the box plain? Sometimes there are stickers, but the stickers usually fall off and leave gross bits on it. So... It's uh, kind of dirty. <laughs> yeah, for me, I actually, uh, I find one of the hardest things is when, when your laptop finally ends its natural life and needs to be replaced with a new laptop. There's the sadness of the stickers that I leave behind and having to start over again. It's hard, eh? Yeah, it's almost like tattoos, you know? You, you see photos of yourself 20 years before. Oh, that was before the tattoo on that arm or whatever. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I feel for you. I'm with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and finally, do you listen to music while you write, or are you more of a total silence person? I usually listen to music as I write. I'm not very loudly, though, so that it doesn't necessarily affect my mood, but I listen to music. So do you have a particular band that is, you know, your go-to band or do you have a style that you listen to when you're writing or does it de- totally depend on the scene? It depends on the book usually. I make a list. So like for my Helma, it's all uh, heavy metal and rock metal uh, music. Uh, and sometimes it's all soundtracks and epic music depending. But with Helma, it was all very heavy metal music and other things. I don't even know what the heck they, they're supposed to be called, but I look up for ideas on YouTube. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I actually have a Helma playlist myself. All right, and awesome. final, finally, uh, what do you want to tell our listeners that you're working on right now? Right now, I am working on a multitude of things, but uh, one of the other exciting things I'll be coming out is I do have another Helma novella that will be coming out in the summer in the same world as uh, the February release, Eye of Glass. So if you love Eye of Glass, or even if you haven't checked it out, please check out my other Helma novella. And I also have uh, a fantasy fairy tale type of horror apocalypse omnibus that's coming out in October, which is nigh. No. Cool. Who is that coming out with? Uh, that's coming out with uh, S&G uh, Publishing. Oh, okay. Just, and where, are they based in Canada? Or? They're based in my house. I self-published those ones. Oh, okay. Can, well, I, tell, can I tell you a secret? Absolutely. <laughs> I love air. secrets. Yes. yes. s and I decided I would take it out because I had a strong vision for a serialization of uh, fairy tales that would make a fairy apocalypse. And uh, I had all the covers and all the coming out, so I decided to take them out for fun. And S and G stands for shits and giggles because I did it for shits and giggles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna look at those books the same way again. <laughs> but they're so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's probably the, a great way to end this conversation. So thank you, Marie, for participating in our Horror Ontario podcast. And your podcast will be. I'm sure enjoyed by all of our listeners. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us today. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. That's our episode. Thank you for joining us on the Great Lakes Horror Company. For more on the HWA, visit us online at lovehorror.biz slash HWA. And for more on tonight's interview subject, Marie Billado, you can find her online at www.mariebillado.com. Now, Sephra is going to walk us through some of the upcoming horrific events we have on the horizon. Yes, we have some terrible events. And the first one is Toronto Comic Con. Please come and see us at the HWA Ontario booth. That's from March 18th to 20th at the Toronto Convention Center. Uh, also in Toronto, it, from April 29th to May 1st, is Ad Astra, which is a uh, one of Canada's longest-running science fiction, fantasy, and horror conventions. Uh, You will find a lot of uh, HWA members, horror writers, science fiction writers, and such at Ad Astra, although HWA will not have a booth as such there, but come and see us on various panels. Uh, The World Horror Convention is in Provo, Utah this year, and that is running from April 28th to May the 1st. Lots of fantastic guests of honor in uh, Utah, if you want to go check them out. 
And then, of course, we have StokerCon, which is uh, presented by the HWA, StokerCon, which includes the Bram Stoker Award Ceremony and our brand new Horror University, and that is from May 12th to 15th in Las Vegas at the Flamingo Hotel. Uh, the room blocks are still really cheap, so book today. And that's about it for now. Thank you very much, Safra. And at Toronto Comic Con, we expect to have some great giveaways at the HWA booth, so be sure to stop by and see us. We're going to have some spooky treats for you all. Uh, remember that we're going to be releasing a new podcast every Monday moving forward. And in our next episode, we're going to be discussing Women in Horror Month. It'll be part one of our uh, feature on Women in Horror. Our episode two interview is going to be with Montreal's Mistress of the Dark, Nancy Kilpatrick, author of the Gothic Bible and Stoker Award nominee for 2016. Before the episode, if you want to brush up on all things Nancy, check out her new anthology, Nevermore, featuring such greats as Christopher Rice, Kelly Armstrong, Lisa Morton, and Margaret Atwood, whose contribution is actually her first completed story written when she was just 16 years old because she was tremendously influenced by Edgar Allan Poe. So that's something worth picking up, reading, getting to know better. Until then, remember that we scare because we care. <laughs>